this is our um, and this and this is our uh, uh, weekly uh, roundtable on um, on issues having to do with uh, uh, COVID and the downturn and the recovery and so forth. Um, the issue of the day is um, that everybody's talking about is how and when to reopen the economy, and in particular, the role of public health interventions and what's the best way of doing this. And to cover this question today, we actually have a, two fantastic economists from the University of Virginia, Anton Kornick and Zachary Bassoon, and they'll be talking a little bit about their uh, their uh, new research that actually sheds an uh, you know an awful lot of light on on these on these key questions and I think really um, helps illuminate some of the public policy decisions that we have to make going forwards. Um, so, uh, Anton, Zach, thanks very much for being here today. Thank you for having us. Great. Thank you for having us. Okay. So let's actually sort of start. You you sort of look at some of the key options that um, that we have going forward. Can you describe a little bit about you know what options you're looking at and what you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our goal in this research project is to evaluate the different policy options that we have at our disposal. So right now, it's mainly non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, such as stay-at-home orders, mandatory social distancing. And what we really do is that, is that we evaluate three different strategies for how to deal with the pandemic. So the first strategy is what we call the herd immunity strategy. And that's what happens if we don't put any public health interventions in place, if we just let people uh, decide on their own uh, what they want to do. Now, in that scenario, the disease will essentially spread through the population until 60% uh, have become infected and have acquired immunity. More than a million people would die under this scenario. And uh, the thing is, when people actually see this happening, they will by themselves choose to scale back their economic activity as the disease gets worse and worse. So we would still see a large slump in economic output in our simulations, up to 15%, lasting for essentially several years until herd immunity is acquired. So we would see so this, this is, so this is, so, cost. So this is so this would be a sort of a, a deep and long-lasting recession if we go the herd immunity route. Right, yeah. and that would be without any mandatory distancing without any mandatory lockdown, just because people essentially get freaked out when they see everybody falling sick and the disease spreading and spreading. Yeah. So the second, second strategy, and let me maybe uh, hand the mic over to Zach now. So the, our, our second strategy that we uh, evaluate is when we do have intervention, what we're, gonna, what we're calling the blind containment strategy. And the reason we call it a blind containment strategy, and it's really what we're facing right now in many advanced economies and across the U.S., is that policymakers cannot identify who's infected and who's not. For instance, because we don't have sufficient testing and tracing capabilities, or the fact that many cases that we're seeing now are asymp um, asymptomatic. Now, un under this scenario, mandatory lockdowns on economic uh, are used to curb economic activity in order to slow the spread of the virus. And it's uh, very costly for the economy. We find up to 15% uh, reduction in econ aggregate economic activity um, by paying this cost. But even under these blunt policy tools, it is still optimal to do it. And it would save the US economy approximately $14 trillion compared to the no intervention strategy of reaching herd immunity. Uh, there's, however, a big problem in that once you pay the cost of uh, mandatory lockdowns, uh, that it keeps the number of infections low, but it also keeps 
the number of people in the in the community that have herd immunity or that have immunity to the disease also low. So we're sitting there under these this blind containment strategy where we still have a lot of people that are susceptible to infection. Uh, and so what's optimal is to keep these lockdowns uh, for as long as possible until at least a vaccine is developed. And that's our second strategy we evaluate. And the third strategy I'll let Anton discuss. Yeah, so the third strategy is what we call the smart containment strategy. And in some ways, that's our best case scenario for how to deal with the disease. Uh, that's where we hope that we are going and where some Far Eastern countries, like, for example, Korea or Taiwan, uh, have already been quite successful. So uh, in some ways, the blind containment that Zach describes, it buys us time. And uh, the best use of that time is to put in place what we need for the smart containment strategy. So let me describe what that is. Smart containment means that we really target the infected specifically, uh, that we engage in a lot of testing and tracing to make sure we get hold of as many of the infected as possible. And we isolate them and we contain the disease and essentially ultimately try to eradicate it from our community. Now, um, the thing is, uh, if you are successful at really separating the infected and the susceptible, then you don't need to impose those across the board lockdowns anymore. And that means the economic cost of the smart containment strategy is much lesser than of the blind containment strategy. So uh, for most of the population, for the uh, uninfected, life can essentially go back to something that's much closer to normal than what we are experiencing right now. So in our analysis, we found that the gain of going from the blind containment to the smart containment strategy is uh, something like $46 trillion uh, in the US. So that's more than twice annual GDP. And, wait, 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 um, let's stop here. $46, $46 yeah. trillion dollars over what period? Uh, uh, basically, uh, over until the disease is resolved. So if we have to uh, engage in the blind containment strategy, that has to last for a long time, uh, essentially until the vaccine is found. The smart containment strategy allows us to go back to a more normal life very quickly. And uh, the cumulative gain of going from blind containment to smart containment is $46 trillion. So it's really so it's the it's an unfathomable sum. That that's really enormous. So basically, basically, you know, then so the, the gap between the 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 smart containment and the herd immunity is like sixty trillion. That's, that's right. Exactly right. That's an astounding amount of uh, of, of money there, even for, even for the U.S. economy. Um, so what you know, so you know, from your perspective, what is the what's the best case and what's the worst case? So in our analysis, it's very clear that the herd immunity strategy is the one that imposes the greatest cost uh, on people. The smart containment strategy, I guess as the title reveals, <laughs> uh, is our best case scenario, is what would allow us to go back to normal life as fast as possible. And let me add in quickly, you know, the usefulness of the smart containment strategy, which again is crucially relies on our ability to test the population and to isolate the infected to the test and tracing system. Uh, the gains from that uh, are, are huge. Once you go to the smart containment strategy and you're able to isolate the infected, the gains from an eventual vaccination uh, are much lower. So you can sort of see both are needed, of course, but um, having sufficient testing and tracing and having a sufficient vaccine uh, are uh, in some sense substitutable to each other. So if it's easier to get to testing and tracing, which our analysis suggests the gains are, are quite large, then that's a useful way to get to the smart containment strategy. So this is really testing, tracing, and, uh, and isolation. That is, that is, that is you, you're sort of taking, so you're thinking this as a, a you, know, you, you know, for the United, for the United States, what we've been pursuing so far has been blind containment, basically. Everybody gets locked down, okay? 
what a lot of what, you, what a lot of the states are doing right now as they open up is a is a shift to the herd immunity. Is that right? That's right. Okay. And so, and so, can you shift from the? Does it make sense to shift from blind containment to herd immunity, or from herd immunity to the smart containment? Is there a logical sequence on these things? So, in some ways, uh, the way I view it is. Um, if we have already paid this tremendous cost from all the lockdowns, giving up the gains we have made by going for the herd immunity strategy uh, is really not a good idea. So um, there, there would have potentially been a case to say, well, let's not do any lockdowns. Let's go for the herd immunity strategy from the get-go from the very beginning. Uh, but now that we have already paid this massive cost and we have more than three, 30 million people unemployed, uh, switching to the herd immunity strategy uh, does not seem like uh, a good policy. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Because so, because what you're saying basically is we've we've invested the money in a lot of you know we've we've you know we've thrown a lot of people out of work. We've we've crashed a lot of businesses in order to gain some time. And and you know if you're going to gain some time, the best thing to do is to use it shift to a smart containment strategy, not to give it all up, open up again and go to herd immunity. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So it's, it's almost the worst case scenario. Once you've paid the cost to blindly contain, you still have a large uh, portion of the population that are susceptible to the disease. And once you switch to the herd immunity strategy, then it's almost like you're starting from ground zero, already paying the cost that we did. That is really, that's really interesting because that, you know, as we sort of think about this from a public policy point of view, it's it's almost like we're sort of missing an opportunity. We've invested the money. We're missing the opportunity to sort of to sort of uh, step up testing, put together uh, contact and trace, because that would sort of get you know save us not even a long run, over a short run, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of losses in lives and a lot of losses in economics. Is that right? That, that's right, yeah. Uh, so, so again, the total cost savings from implementing that smart containment strategy would be in the order of $60 trillion. So it's really a massive gain that consists both of the value of life and of not having to endure a long-lasting recession because we can return to more normal life when we have managed to contain the virus. So, so really, you know, let me just say, really, what you're saying is that we're on the verge that maybe we sort of did the right thing with the with the blind with with stopping everything now, but we're really about to make a very large mistake by not um, intervening on the public health side right now. So I would say it depends. Uh... I, I think uh, many states have made a lot of progress in ramping up their testing capacity. Uh, the, the tracing capacity is probably something that's still lagging behind in a lot of places. Uh, yeah. If uh, states, as they're opening up, manage to engage in sufficient tracing and testing, uh, and some of the states that don't have too big of a disease burden uh, and who have been proactive may be able to do that, then that would be reasonable. Uh, if we don't do anything on the public health side and we just relent on the lockdown and uh, hope that life will go back to normal, uh, then what is bound to happen is that the virus just continues to grow exponentially, uh, that um, as the disease burden and the number of deaths rise, people will essentially freak out and engage in social distancing on their own. And uh, we will pay a massive economic cost on top of their life loss. That's, that doesn't sound like a good idea. So if anybody uh, has questions at this point, please uh, send them to me at mmandel at progressivepolicy.org. Okay. Um, mmandel at progressivepolicy.org. And, and then we'll sort of get them on the air. So, one of the things that I liked about your research when I saw it is that you clearly distinguish between um, the decisions that individuals make 
and then the decisions that would be best socially. Okay, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about that? Yeah, we'd love to. So what we do is we approach it from the viewpoint uh, of economists and the economist tool set. Uh, but to do that, what we do is we borrow from models of epidemiologists uh, that have developed models to understand how infectious diseases spread throughout communities. And But what we do is we embed economic decision makers into those models. And importantly, the key aspect of an economic decision and an infectious disease model is that uh, uh, agents, individual agents, when they engage in economic and social interactions, uh, namely that requires some amount of physical contact, the more they engage in these interactions, the more uh, the disease transmits. And so what we see is that on an individual level, that completely rational individuals, when deciding how much activity they want to engage in, are going to weigh their own private costs and benefits of, of making that decision, namely, the private cost of increasing your activity is that you increase your own individual risk of infection. Uh, now, why in our containment strategies and different policy options, we find that no intervention, when individuals are just privately weighing their own costs and benefits, lead to uh, a, a large uh, increase in the infection rate and a large number of deaths, is due to what economists call uh, an externality. Uh, and so in this particular case, this is an infection externality. It's that when, I, when I'm making my own private decision, I'm only weighing the cost that I have of becoming infected. And certainly with coronavirus, with COVID-19, it is a big cost because the infection rate and the infection fatality rate is much larger than we've seen, um, for instance, with the, with the flu uh, or, or, or other infectious diseases. But what individuals don't do is they don't internalize that when they become infected, they'll also impose costs on other eight people in the economy by making them infected. And it goes on and on, right? They don't internalize that then those people that get infected will infect other people and so on. And so what we find is that if we quantify this into numbers, we find that an individual agent uh, S, uh, weighs the cost of their own infection around $80,000, while the societal cost of one person becoming infected is almost four times as large at around $280,000. So what that means is that the infection externalities with infectious diseases are huge. That's, that's actually an enormous difference. So basically, I, you know, this is, this is really helpful to think about. It basically says is that for an individual, for individual sort of just thinking about themselves, the expected cost of being exposed to uh, a COVID-19 infection is about $80,000. And that takes into account, you know, your odds of, of getting sick and then your odds of dying. Okay. But if you sort of took into account all the effects on everybody else, the, the expected loss to society would be two hundred and eighty thousand dollars, which is just you know just so much. That's an enormous difference. Okay, I mean, I mean we don't see when we sort of look at things like usually when we talk about externalities, we think about things like pollution. Okay, and the effect of you know that the the, 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 the a factory sort of polluting the outside air. We never see big differences as big as this. This is one of the largest externalities that I've ever seen. Yeah, that, that's a really good analogy. And the way to think about it is just like in pollution, the environment is a public good. In this case, health, public health is a public good also, which requires right, some kind of intervention because of these externalities. And, and because the difference is so large, it actually is worthwhile for society, for the government to sort of be very you know, active in terms of Hiring a lot of people to do to do contact trace and contact and paying for a lot of paying for a lot of tests. Okay, I don't know. Have you been able to sort of figure out kind of what the right level of intervention is? How how much it might cost? Yeah. So in some ways, uh, the numbers that we were throwing around before uh, they would also tell us how much it is worth to pay for these different strategies. So if we want to uh, go from the blind containment to the smart containment strategy uh, that's worth um, $46 trillion for the economy. 
No, uh, we will never spend forty-six trillion dollars on testing. No. So uh, that means any reasonable and any even any costly expenditure that makes us better able to engage in more testing and tracing is really worth it. We can pay up to forty-six trillion dollars, and it will still be worth it. For forty-six trillion would pay for a very large uh, contact and tracing core. I can tell you that. Okay, that's right. So let's let's actually let's let's you know if you sort of paid paid people you know forty thousand dollars a year and you had an army of a hundred thousand people or maybe call it a million people, then we're sort of talking about okay forty forty billion dollars a year, which is much 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 less than forty six trillion. Okay, right. And so you know we're sort of you know even if we sort of even if we said look. We need to. Um, uh, we need to put a sizable amount of money into this. The the potential benefit from doing this is just enormous. It sounds like this is this is why I found your your analysis so helpful because you laid out a framework in which we could actually quantify um, the benefits and costs of these strategies that people have just been have just been. Tossing around. I mean, why, is there any reason why we wouldn't want to do this? Yes, yeah, so this this is a really good point. You know, obviously, as as economists, we're you know, and, and epidemiologists right now, there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly the parameters that are controlling uh, coronavirus. For instance, we're still trying to get better estimates on what the infection fatality rate, how that depends on age, how that depends on other uh, socioeconomic status. It's not clear how much of the society, once you have the disease, becomes immune to the disease or not. And so what's, you know, the, the main takeaway here is that these numbers are so large that even reasonable robustness, you start moving around these different parameters, the cost of life, the infection fatality rate, and you continue to find astronomical benefits of, of putting in these systems of testing and tracing and vaccine development. If you were if you were talking to a policymaker at this point, what what would what would you what would you tell them? So I would say focus all your efforts at containment, uh, and I think testing has already received a lot of publicity. We've made a lot of progress. We still need more resources. I think tracing has been a little bit underemphasized. It's going to require uh, large amounts of public health workers who all need to be trained, who all need to be hired, uh, and who will need a lot of resources. So, Michael, you put forward the number of 40 billion before. Uh, 40 billion is uh, absolutely worth it, given how much we have to gain. But it's still a significant amount of money for cash-strapped states, uh, who will be the ones who have to bear that uh, public health expenditure. So yeah, I think uh, we we should really try to put as many resources as possible into the testing and tracing, and of course isolation that we need to contain the disease. What what's the timing on this? Is this something that you know, as you look at your as you look at your model, is this something that we need to do right now? Can we have can we see what happens or 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 you know, is every you know is every step that we go down the herd immunity route sort of lost? You know, lost time. Yeah, uh, yeah it's not only lost time; it also makes it much harder uh, because the disease grows exponentially. And if you want to do tracing uh, every week, you wait means you have to track down twice as many people. And uh, if you have large infection rates, that gets harder and harder. So we are not only losing time, we are also really making uh, the, the strategy more difficult to pursue. And, and again, as, as the nature, as infections grow, you, agents on their own are going to scale back activity. So it's not as if the herd immunity strategy with no intervention doesn't lead to big economic costs too, uh, at least to both big economic costs and loss of life. Uh, the longer you wait. I think, I think that's a really important point that people are, are you know, haven't gotten that, that, that choosing that choosing not to intervene in a public health sense has large economic costs as well okay as well as large costs in lost lives and right. cuz so what what you're doing here is you're actually 
you've got you've got both factors in here going at the same time. Okay, um, in a in a very in a very interesting and 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 useful way. Now, one of the fascinating things for me, of course, is every once in a while you hear people saying, "Okay, let's just let's just put, use a lot of resources to eradicate this," and other people say, "You know, it can't be done." But your sense is that it that it that it could be done if we if we're able to put enough resources in and that it's worth it. If we look at other countries, uh, we can see examples both in in far uh, in the far east in Asia, but also in Europe uh, that it seems to be working. Uh, we will probably experience periodic flare-ups, uh, but still pursuing the containment is so much cheaper in terms of life and in terms of how long the uh, economic slump will last that it's worthwhile doing. Good. Okay. So let me just ask, is there anybody else who, out there who would like to ask a question? Feel free to jump in at this point. Okay, no questions. You know, Zach, Anton, this is absolutely this is absolutely fantastic. Okay, I mean, I don't think I think it's uh, I think it's rare that that you know that economic analysis just hits right on right on point there. And so, um, very glad you found it. Yeah, thank 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 you very much for joining us. Thanks yeah, for having me. Thank you. Okay, and uh, we'll we'll be uh, we'll be posting the um, the audio of this on our uh, on our website, and as well as links to uh, Anton and Zach's work. and uh, And please join us uh, next week. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.